before I was sick for three weeks, I went along to the Mega Gaming Expo with my friend and his son who has decided that he wants to make video games. What better place to see the industry than the capital of the industry in Canada, Montreal. I thought, you know, this seems like a really good opportunity to tag along and film a child playing video games. I really enjoy watching socially awkward programmers being forced to make eye contact with people for extended periods of time, seeing the kind of behind the scenes of them rushing around, fixing stuff right there in front of you. You have the really big studios, Ubisoft and, and EA and stuff. And then you have all the small guys. Literally, you have the guy who's on the poster of a company or like one or two dudes sitting next to this computer showing off this thing that they've been working on for years. They finally got to roll their DeLorean into the uh, mall car park and have uh, Marty McFly here and see what they've been up to. When I know that an industry is subsidized, I always have this like, is this real thought in the back of my head. Just don't think these guys are for real. Ultimately, you know, if you throw enough money at anything, you can have what looks like a success, but maybe it's not a long-term sustainable thing. In this video, I'm looking at why the gaming industry has taken off, and I'm asking the question, could all of it be taken away? There's the standard base programs that any business in Canada or Quebec can use. Low interest loans and financing and self-employment support. Hey, instead of being unemployed, how about being self-employed for a year? You also have things like the Canadian Media Fund, They're probably gonna make it rain on the Maple Syrup Tycoon. However, the programs that are most interesting are the ones that actually specifically deal with the gaming industry. Most of it is tax credits. So what tax credits are is um, the government saying, if you make money, you can pretend that you didn't make money with this uh, credit on your tax account. When you hear in the news like Amazon, Walmart, uh, Electric Co made $22 bazillion last year and they didn't pay any taxes, tax credits. So a refundable tax credit for a corporation is like the Cadillac of tax credits. <laughs> this is actually the form of tax credits that most of ours are. It's a tax credit that lets you go sub-zero. That's the situation where it's like, this company made a billion dollars last year and we're paying them 500 million dollars. Fucking outrageous. Would you like to know more? Of the 4.2 billion dollars, about 2.7 billion dollars arrived in the form of tax credits. So with tax credits for the gaming industry, we have one core one, which is 100% for them, and then two ones that they can access to a smaller degree. So the first one is called Tax Credit for Multimedia Titles. This is the core one for the gaming industry. It's up to 37.5% off your employees' salaries. Uh, it's capped at $100,000 for 80% of your employees. So you can have like one in five employees that you elect to get the same 37.5% off who earn over $100,000. If the title is in French and it's being marketed as a commercial product, you can get the maximum amount and then it kind of goes down from there. The other tax credit is called the e-business tax credit. It's not specifically for gaming, but you can see how gaming companies do access this tax credit, building like a server behind the scenes or some tools or maybe a bug database. It's smaller in that it's only 24% or so of wages, but it's accessed by like, you know, 600 companies, which is a lot more than the, uh, the multimedia title tax credit. The third one, which the gaming industry kind of gets their sticky fingers into a little bit, is the research and development tax credit. The R&D tax credit basically says to companies, you know, I know that you enjoy making ineffective cold medicines, but maybe what you could do is make an effective cold medicine. Here, we'll sweeten the pot. If you get like a couple of your employees working on making a cold medicine that actually works, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kick in like some of their salaries. <clears throat> R&D tax credits are, uh, a kind of bullshit. I mean, most of the tax credits are. Effectively, the government's having to come up with some metric to say, oh yeah, this company deserves it. Research showed that they were prone to being abused. So governments, including the government of Quebec, have kind of like tightened things up over the years. There's this whole industry of consultants who come in and help you access the tax credit. To stay on top of all the different programs that are available, they're changing every year. And I find it very useful to have people who are very specialized in that regard. I've actually experienced this myself, seeing this guy come in and be like, um, can you use this word three times in this sentence? Because that's how the bureaucratic person like, you know, stamping off on it. They just need to see this word here and here for you to have access to the funds. 
that whole thing was just such a kind of like, thank you government for deciding that this is the way the money should be distributed. The problem you get is you, you build this boutique industry of consultants, which only reasonably large businesses can afford. So the money's not going towards the person who has like two employees and has just started out a company. The money is instead going towards the company that can afford this $200,000 a year consultant character who fill in the form for them. So in summary with the tax credits, the gaming industry at this point has access to at least 230 million, right up to about 1.2 billion. But a contrast that the whole film, TV and live show industry in Quebec adds up to around 400 million. So the gaming industry is a bigger play than even all of that. And all of that includes a lot of like supporting French language stuff and all those mandates as well. So yeah, it's a big guy. The financial stuff is obvious, but there's a kind of less obvious uh, cost. If you have a billion dollars, a billion dollars is going to make a big difference anywhere. You know, we could maybe have a car or manufacturing uh, industry or like solar panels or, you know, medical, biotech. If you throw a billion dollars into something, you're going to change the economy around. There's also a cost for other businesses. So, um, how do you explain this? Can you sit at a computer for long hours and do technically demanding activities? You're hired, says half of the managers in the country. There's a lot of industries that would like to use those workers. Cough Medicine Co, with their garbage cough medicines, are paying $1,000 a week to do the work, and Ubisoft can get the same person for $700 a week. You end up kind of competing with the government instead of having a, like an even playing field. And you never really know what that costs your economy. In the long term, if we had done nothing, we might have ended up with this kind of organically built a natural industry. Obviously, people in the tech sector, which is what the gaming industry mainly is, are highly employable. <laughs> Some people would argue that you shouldn't subsidize the salaries of people who wouldn't have any issue getting a job and should instead be subsidizing, say, a former wood pulp uh, worker who doesn't have a job right now and actually is struggling to get employment. I kind of experienced this one myself while I was working at a locally owned company. Probably half the employees left that company and ended up working at Ubisoft. I actually met up with someone the other day and this asshole had uh, left to work at Ubisoft and I said to them, uh, would you say you're getting paid about 37.5% uh, more there? And uh, they laughed and said, ha, yeah. So, you know, you can see it in effect in a very real way there for these employers that just don't happen to be quite in that sort of tech sector start to notice hundreds of millions of dollars in tax money or potential revenue going into these multi-billion dollar corporations. So the big benefactors get political. Ubisoft always have been. They're actually involved in crafting the program originally. They create these trade organizations that work to defend and embed the tax credits permanently. Aside from the trade organizations, they also do this thing where they distribute jobs around different electorates so that they have this wide voter base that's going to defend the tax credit. You think the whole sub is made in one place? because the fin or whatever the fuck, it comes from one factory in one state. And then this little round fucking window comes from another place, right? And the fuel rods are from Cheese Dick, Wisconsin. We are going to lose votes and seats everywhere. As an example, Ubisoft, time for some more. Another round, Ubisoft. So Ubisoft opened an office in Saguenay and sure you can say, oh, thanks Ubisoft, you're just doing a great job of making sure you um, get to all the potential employees you can have there because all the talent has been absorbed in Montreal, sure. But you can also see how they make it really hard for any politician campaigning to cut corporate welfare to get elected in Montreal and Quebec City and now the Saguenay and anywhere else that they choose to open an office. Because in a lot of these communities, the Ubisoft studio will seem like the good news story of the last decade. It's the ominous threat behind subsidies that become very, very big. You end up with industries that feel entitled to the tax credit who are kicking in funds to your political system and making these groups that look like they're citizens, but they're not really. It'll be like citizens in support of the gaming industry. And they lobby and make sure that you'll never ever be rid of them. Fucking outrageous. That's how you end up with a very liberal province like British Columbia still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry or Saskatchewan, which subsidizes farming. Neither of those industries need the tax credits anymore but uh, it's really, really hard for you to take that money back after you start giving it out. 
So it kind of costs us in a political way as well outside of Quebec. We get blamed for not having our finances in order. Quebec tabled a budget with a $4 billion surplus thanks to a $13 billion equalization payment from Ottawa, which came from the workers that many of you have had to lay off. We can't be totally sure that uh, this is going to work. So it's kind of like having um, a bunch of debt and then going back to university for a random degree, even though we already have a few good degrees. Ontario and Alberta are like your parents saying like, whoa, 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 why don't, you, why don't we pay that debt down and then you can do this. Those are the obvious downsides, you know, the sort of thing you'd get any time that you subsidize an industry. But what did we get for this? Well, we got an industry that didn't exist before and as talented um, and creative as Montreal is, I think it's absolutely 100% without a doubt would not have an industry this size if the government hadn't thrown all this money in. And in the 90s when the Parti Quebecois put this in, it was really groundbreaking, you know? The video game industry wasn't like it is now, a much bigger industry than film. So I think you gotta give them credit for like, seeing an opportunity and as a government jumping on that, you know, it's pretty ballsy. In the 80s and 90s, there were studios everywhere. You know, you had like Bullfrog in the UK and uh, Melon House in Australia, which made Cake Andy, which is my favorite game when I was a kid for some reason. Texas had like ID Software and Apogee, which made uh, Hocus Pocus, which I used to play. Nevada had uh, Westwood, but by the end of the 90s, it basically consolidated and Montreal, through doing this, managed to actually make us a video gaming center. We're the fifth uh, largest uh, center of video gaming in the world. The other thing that you'll always see used as an argument when there's a subsidized industry is uh, what's called economic multipliers. Ubisoft's open up their office in the Mile End and they rent space from some local person who now gets to have money. They drive a food truck into the building and uh, and, and defeat the purpose of it being a truck. And then like Yubi Sushi opens up down the road and, and they get to make money. And multipliers are real. <laughs> They're kind of a difference between like a big developed economy and a small economy. It's just cash flowing around between things. So the issue is if the government were like, all right guys, we're just gonna pay a billion dollars for people to dig a hole and it's kind of a mining, I guess it's a mining subsidy. Most people would still like buy a hot dog at lunch. The question really is, is, is this a good economic multiplier versus other industries? The multipliers for the video game industry are really good. Mining, for example, doesn't have great multipliers. Video games though, the people that are working in these offices, living in Montreal, buying in the local market, it's a pretty good industry for multipliers. However, I think the most obvious argument against the multipliers is, well, why spend $1 billion? Let's spend $100 billion and get a trillion dollars worth of economic multipliers. It's pretty obvious that the multipliers taper off because at some point to raise the money to subsidize the industry, you're taxing Yubi Sushi so much that it's not worth Yubi Sushi existing. So when we're talking about all of these subsidies and stuff, there is a apt parallel story going on that I call the Hollywood story. It's the 1920s, the film industry took off in California. It became the ubiquitous uh, capital of filmmaking in the world. The industry did very well and the, out of that came the VFX industry. But in the 1990s, British Columbia, which happened to be in the same time zone and just three hours flight away, started offering subsidies. And at first that just meant that uh, Mulder and Scully were running around Vancouver instead of wherever they were supposed to be, like Chicago or something. Where are they supposed to be based? I think it's part of what actually what makes the X-Files so weird, because you're watching it and you're like, where is this place? But eventually it drained the entire VFX industry from LA and relocated it to Vancouver. So a lot of veterans of the industry kind of make jokes about like, remember that uh, 10 year period where everyone had to decide if they wanted to live in Canada or do something else with their career? And then what happened is because film and VFX is super sexy, politicians were like, oh yeah, I like that. 
they basically took that same policy and just added 5%. All of a sudden, the UK and Singapore and Australia have these huge VFX subsidies. By 2017, British Columbia was forking out like $2 billion a year. The government came in and had to just kind of pump the brakes on it, right? So now the question is, after all that expense, has Vancouver actually got something long-term here? Or did we just ignite a fire with gasoline and then it just burnt off and now we don't have anything? This brings up the obvious point. If a subsidy actually works, then it's probably not going to be sustainable because the bigger the industry gets, the more of it it costs. And you can very easily find yourself in a race to the bottom with other places who are prepared to pay even more money with lower wages. There's a lot of stories coming out about we, we subsidized it so much, but we didn't subsidize it to this crazy amount that these guys prepared to, so these assholes left, and then we had to spend a billion dollars and we got nothing. So we have to move out of this um, race to the bottom thing. So, so far the program has worked, but now we're in a different phase, and the strategy has to change. We're at full employment, other jurisdictions have jumped on and now you can see similar tax credits being applied in other countries and even right next door in Ontario. The leading experts in tax relief for UK game developers. And some of these places, they're going to be able to outspend us and they're going to have educated workers who could potentially work for less. These costs are also increasing dramatically. I think we need to move now into what I'd call phase two of the gaming industry in Quebec. We need to transition to a sustainable model that's not just based on being cheap, because that's just stupid. You're not going to win that game. Point one, we have to support original and innovative stuff and make sure we aren't just subsidizing studios that are doing porting or don't have any senior management right here based in Quebec. The Ubisoft example I think is pretty good. Ubisoft Montreal used to make games like uh, Donald Duck Going Quackers. Not a classic game, didn't even know it existed. Then Ubisoft decided to close its New York office and consolidate its um, North American headquarters here in Montreal. They brought this stealth shooter along with them called The Drift. The Montreal office had been tasked with building a new Tom Clancy game and they turned the drift into Splinter Cell, which became a really big hit. Then the studio created this parkour heavy version of Prince of Persia, which resulted in the original IP Assassin's Creed. So there's your progress, right? You're making a Donald Duck Crash Bandicoot clone, and then you're kind of like building something that is original, but maybe the original idea didn't come um, domestically. And then ultimately you create a brand new thing uh, which is incredibly 2004. <laughs> hey guys, remember parkour? That's where you want to be. So now we have a situation with Ubisoft where it's way harder for them to leave Montreal because we moved from being just a production line to a thing where like all of the IP and all the people who originally made um, a thing which made them a bunch of money are based in Montreal. If they left Montreal, Ubisoft would have to try to convince hundreds of Montrealers to move to France or wherever the next office is going to be because those people are so integral to them being able to make successful games. So in the government subsidies, we don't want to be funding porting because the decision on where you have a studio is not just about dollars. So if like Nintendo decided to move its workforce to Orlando, we all know they wouldn't be able to make the same games. You couldn't say, oh, you could do this anywhere. This is a thing for the government to promote now. We want to develop the reputation that Montreal has some special source for new ideas. Just like New York for the finance industry or Houston is for the oil industry, you got to be special. And special is actually not really about salary. How do you do this? Well, a lot of people have already looked at this. It's a pretty common problem. So it's interesting to note the Canadian Media Fund pushes for original content already. So you can't get money from them for like sequels. So Red Barrels, which is a local producer, textbook example of the sort of thing you want to promote, when it made at last, it used their funding to get the first version of the game off the ground. So you could set things up so that the subsidy is staggered. If your programmer is working on an original first concept, you get the 37.5% subsidy or maybe Maybe even more, but you don't get that for like the sequel. If you're doing something like porting a game, you have a very, very small subsidy. So you would have uh, bigger producers saying something like, well, let's get Montreal to create the original title and we'll get the Toronto office to do the port because those idiots don't know how to spend money. <laughs> 
The point is we now have like a real dumb kind of flat tax credit and we probably should start to play with it and tweak it a little bit so that it pushes things in the direction that we want. Another solution for our current predicament is placing money into education. So it's almost always better to put money into education than it is putting it into companies because those people that you invest in, even if the gaming industry doesn't work out or whatever, those educated citizens are going to be an asset to whatever else comes down the pipeline. At this point, we're the fifth largest region for game development in the world, and we've got uh, historically low unemployment rates because we're now being constrained by hires not new international studios. Every couple of months a new studio is announced and they're not soaking up any slack in employees. So we want to set up these education programs so that local kids can more easily join the industry and bolster the ranks and also probably want to set up half the residency programs so that young talented people from around the world can move here and move us from fifth to fourth or third. What I'd propose is a program that gave people a no interest loan to move to Quebec from other places as long as they're going to end up in a university program or polytechnic that feeds into the video game industry. This loan is no interest and you're going to get trained. But if you leave the province of Quebec, you're going to start to pay a lot of interest. Well, if you stick around, eventually, because of inflation, that loan's going to be nothing. You pay it off in one paycheck if you finish out your career in Quebec. This program doesn't even have to be international, it could be residents from other provinces. Right now, people from Ontario, when they're weighing up where they want to go to university... It's like algebra. Why you gotta put numbers and letters together? Why can't you just go fuck yourself? They choose Ontario just because they don't want to be stuck washing dishes for a year, waiting until they can go to university. The third pillar of this new phase would be to support local businesses rather than these international companies. We want to domesticate this industry. We want to keep VIP here. Of course it is weird to be subsidizing these big foreign corporations. The worst thing is that we have these really high taxes on small businesses here in Quebec, the highest in Canada. We've essentially kind of engineered things so that we encourage large Ubisoft operations and discourage independent studios. It's kind of crazy, back in the old days when Ubisoft first came in, the local operators had to fight to get the credit that was being given to Ubisoft applied to themselves. And that alone tells you that the original plan really wasn't thought through too much. And it was very, very, very much focused on these large multinationals. So we should adjust these subsidies so they favor domestic companies now. We've got the big guys in. There are now thousands of Montrealers who are really good at making AAA world-class video games. So you could reduce the subsidy a little bit for international developers and increase the subsidy a little bit for or local developers. The fourth pillar, something we should write in to this policy at this point is a sunset clause. If by 2050, say, we can't make video games in Montreal without massive government subsidies, then we fucked up. This isn't farming where you can argue, well, for national security purposes. So what we could do is set up subsidies so that it holds for a, say, 10 year period and then it starts to decrease by a percentage point every year after that. So you would combine this with moving subsidies to local businesses from foreign businesses and you could actually give huge support for small locally owned studios because we now have more funds available as there is an eventual reduction in the amount we're paying. Sunsetting also helps address that special interest problem with politics where the companies entrench themselves. It kind of lets them know this is not a forever thing and let's then plan for a future that doesn't have them subsidized to the tune of a billion or two a year by the local government. When I say phase two and talk about the video game industry, I'm thinking a lot of the model for developing countries. The company started in 1974, making plastic parts for TV sets. But under Guo's leadership, it has grown into the world's biggest contract electronics manufacturer. So we're currently moving into the later phase of this. Companies like Panache, who make Ancestors, Chasing Rats, who make Struggling, and Trebuchet, who do this VR party stuff, are Quebec-owned and operated, and they're making really unique content, and we need to back that stuff really, really hard. I think it's really timely that we start having this conversation about the video game industry, because Remember Vancouver and its VFX industry? Well, guess where many of those companies 
are now starting to open satellite offices. It's Montreal. There's been an 88% increase in the number of companies doing this here because we have better subsidies. <clears throat> it's interesting that just as we start to realize the race to the bottom that we may have entered into in one industry, we're finding ourselves being that competitor that's coming in and making it impossible for another province to the industry. It is the originator of subsidies in. A lot of that is because the only person that likes red carpets more than film stars is politicians. <laughs> Thank you.